the opportunity to become one of those invited guests and walk on and explore actual sets. This is where they all make up the movies. Some of the people, the behind the scenes folks right over there that make all that movie magic for you. TV, uh, the stage uh, TV stage wonder. Uh, stage on your right hand side is uh, the oldest Brazil. building on the front lot, sound stage 28. Stage 28 was originally constructed in 1925 to house the elaborate Paris Opera House sets for the Phantom of the Opera. Not the musical, but the original horror movie version of that story starring Lon Chaney. Those Paris Opera House sets from more than 80 years ago are still standing over there on your right in Stage 28. Nobody's ever had the nerve to tear them down. They are reputedly haunted. Uh, stage 28 is annually named one of the most haunted places in Los Angeles. Uh, over the years, some of the movie's biggest monsters, from the Bride of Frankenstein all the way up to the Grinch, from how the Grinch stole Christmas, have One, called two. Stage 28 home. On your left-hand side, Stage 27, there's a big in-ground water tank in there that they used to test the mechanical shark before they started project production on Steven Spielberg's classic film, Jaws. A lot of activity over there today. They're in there right now working on a new Will Ferrell movie uh, based on the old television series Land of the Lost. Uh, that film will be uh, premiering next year. Definitely going to be good for some laughs there. Now it's time to move from the big screen to small screen. Aside from making memorable movies, NBC Universal has a long history of producing hit TV shows, many of which filmed right here on the Universal lot. Our television history goes back some 69 years with the transmission of the opening ceremonies of the 1939 New York World's Fair marking our first television broadcast. Over the years, we have produced and televised some of the biggest shows ever seen on network television. Such favorites as Law & Order, Seinfeld, Cheers, The Cosby Show, Friends, ER, Battlestar Galactica, uh, The Today Show, The Tonight Show, The Tomorrow Show, uh, The West Wing, Saturday Night Live, and uh, just a pretty short hour. However, as you can see, many of the sets were left in ruins. The buildings destroyed were facades, uh, with just the fronts and the sides built, because that's the only part that the camera sees. Uh, most of the buildings that we're going to see out here today, later on in the tour especially, obviously, are uh, just what they call facades. They, they really just build the front and the sides, and they don't really finish them off on the inside. The buildings are not really completed structures. They can only really be used for exterior filming. Uh, that whole collective area over there uh, is known as the Metropolitan Sets. And some of the biggest movies of all time filmed in that area. Things like Spider-Man 2 with Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst. Uh, the biggest movie of last year, Transformers, uh, directed by Michael Bay. So several scenes over there on what was known as New York Street at the time. Uh, some Academy Award winning films, things like The Sting with Robert Redford and Paul Newman filmed in that area. Any fans of Seinfeld would have seen uh, oh, those streets over that area on multiple episodes of Seinfeld. Uh, camera. Over the years, a lot of these picture cars have become uh, every bit as uh, famous and as recognizable as the stars that have driven them. Uh, we have just a, in a, appropriately enough, talking about uh, cars, we have just a little bit of traffic up here in front of us, so uh, we have just a little extra moment here. Uh, picture cars have evolved a great deal over the years and the, uh, the techniques that go into filming those big uh, action scenes and chase sequences uh, and whether from it's where? The, uh, the death mobile from Animal House or that? Magnum P.I.'s Ferrari I'm sure you'll uh, recognize a lot of very famous sheet metal along here to your left uh, that Ferrari, that was the car that uh, every teenager my age, every teenage boy wanted growing up, but uh, you wouldn't win any drag races in that Ferrari, that's just a Ferrari shell with a little uh, golf cart motor underneath there. Uh, for you science oh, fiction fans, recognize this one. mule from Serenity, Back the future. Uh, which uh, doesn't have any tires on it, but they still consider it a picture car. Uh, I'm still waiting for those flying cars they said we don't be driving right about now. Uh, up here towards the front again, there's some of the cars from the uh, Back to the Future series of movies. That's one of 15 different DeLoreans that was used in the making of the Back to the Future series of films. Uh, a lot of times people don't realize that they, uh, they see a movie, television show, they see just one uh, car that looks like it's the same car that they use throughout the entire uh, film and it yeah, you know, has a real, uh, real iconic status. But uh, almost without exception, they have multiple versions of those cars. They'll have one that's a specially equipped stunt car, maybe for a chase scene, especially reinforced and uh, has upgraded suspension on it and things like that. Extra roll cages put on the inside to protect the stunt drivers. They'll have another version of the car that's maybe kind of just a, a shell of it that they use for a scene where the car is getting destroyed or blown up or uh, uh, shot up or something like that. And then they'll have uh, yet another version of the car where it's the uh, car that they use for the actual actor sitting behind the wheel and 
uh, and shooting the scene. A lot of times when you see a driving scene, too, when you see uh, the camera is, uh, you know, playing a scene, the guys look like they're driving in a car, the, the actors are driving a car, that car is actually usually on the back of a low-lying, a very low-set uh, flat flatbed trailer, and that car is just being pulled behind a truck, and the camera is positioned in such a way so that you get the shots through the window of the actors, who just are, of course, acting like they're driving. Uh, a little, uh, little something over here on your left that uh, not everybody gets to see all the time. Uh, one of our trams. Uh, see, I told you, I got AAA out here almost immediately. It's, uh, it's, it's worth every penny. You know, just, just get on the phone. Those guys come right out and help you out. So, uh, one of our uh, VIP trams there, which is just having a little work done. It's, uh, it's like NASCAR sort of. They get the guys out here and they <laughs> jack that thing up, change the tires. But uh, right now, we uh, we're going to take you to a, a little island off the coast of Costa Rica. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Oh, it sounds a little better when Richard Attenborough says it, I know. But the insect pieces, the, uh, the props, the picture cars that you see around you here, were all used in the series of Jurassic Park movies. Obviously, the first two of those directed by Steven Spielberg. Some of you, uh, I think two of our, you just had a big movie that came out so recently, didn't you? You might have heard about that. <laughs> the, uh, this big bubble lab over here on your left-hand side, uh, you might remember that. Uh, dangling over the edge of a cliff with Julianne Moore hanging out the back window of it. That cliff was actually just a parking lot on the front lot here at Universal that they dressed up to look like a cliff. And, oh, what's going on back there? Oh, look at that. Same bloody guy, you hear that? That's why we were actually delayed. The uh, dinosaurs were on a union mandated lunch break. So. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry, folks. Don't worry. It's, it's no big deal. A little club soda, it gets that dinosaur spit right out. There's no problem with that. <laughs> but, uh, when, uh, when Steven Spielberg started here at Universal, one of his first assignments was to take a young writer out on a tour of the back lot. Uh, that writer's name was Michael Crichton, who would uh, later go on and write the novel Jurassic Park that served as the inspiration uh, for that whole series of films. Uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's first actual directing assignment at Universal was an episode of the old television series Night Gallery. Uh, it was sort of like the Twilight Zone. It was a, sort of a uh, pet show like that. And uh, the episode was supposed to star Betty Davis, who at that time obviously was at the end of her career and was a huge star. She didn't take too kindly to the idea of being directed by an unknown 20-something-year-old named Spielberg. And uh, they actually replaced her on the episode. And her part was played by Joan Crawford. But in all the uh, Jurassic Park movies, all the movies really, the weather always plays an important part. It's setting just the right mood for a scene. And, listen, I, I, you don't want to hear me talk about the weather. Not when we have access to America's favorite weather and you know him as Al Roker. Hi everybody, here's today's forecast for the Universal Backlot. It's going to be sunny and dry in Six Points, Texas. Cool and cloudy in the middle of Europe. Expect snow and sleet on New York Street, and we've got a high chance of fog and precipitation for Skull Island, Amity Island, and Ida Dubois. That's your forecast for today. Now here's a look at what's going on in your neck of the lot. Oh, flash flood warning. Oh, that's not flash flood warning. Oh, well, there you go. What do you know? Right on cue. Now, some of you have sharp eye because the rain being produced by the overhead sprinkler system uh, shoots the water up into the air, allows it to fall naturally back down to earth. That's the way they create rain on television and in the movies. But sometimes the rain doesn't show up too well on camera, depending on what the lighting of the up. And they mix a little milk in with the water to get it to show up better on screen. Usually, it doesn't go on this long, though. They have some problems with the drinkage job. Oh, yeah. It looks like we've got a bit of a flood development there in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, take care back here. Look out back there, everybody. Whoa! Oh! Oh, that's the mother nature. Awesome to behold. Oh, yeah. I guess I just rebuilt the tank. Uh, take a look at your screens. You'll see the exact set in action. That's the fat liar with Paul Giovanni and Frank Minnis. You can't ever run the wall, kid! Yeah, we'll see about that. Oh, he wishes he was on the tram back then. Now, of course, all that water is recycled uh, after it leaves here. They send it back up to the park. They used to make all the hot dogs with up in the park. Now, <laughs> this area we're pulling through right here, this little town square, is on screen right now in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Ooh, Indiana Jones. you've seen that movie, uh, when they're in the Peruvian market, sort of outdoor market, 
was all filmed right back there in what is known as Old Mexico. Old Mexico has also been on television on things like uh, uh, Without a Trace and Heroes. Uh, but now we're going to cross the border, taking from Old Mexico out here to the Old West, the wild, wild West. Here to tell you a little more about these surrounding streets, that old cowboy whoopee. Did you know that more movies have been shot on these streets than any other spot in the world? Now, during the silent film era, they could shoot up to six movies at the same time, one on each one of these six streets. That's why it's called Six Points, because each street, and it's on bank, it's on sheriff's office, it's on saloon, and it's on the hotel. Now, it turns out that this town ain't big enough for both of us. So get on back on to your tram stagecoach thingy. Get out of here. Oh, oh. Now this is one of the very first areas developed when Universal started making motion pictures on this location almost 100 years ago. In the first year of operation out here, Universal made more than 100 silent film westerns here in Six Points, Texas. Uh, people sometimes see that the streets are all blacktop, and they wonder how do they uh, make westerns down here. Well, when they need to uh, shoot a western era picture, they literally bring down truckloads of dirt, dump tons of dirt on those streets, spread it all out. Uh, and then, of course, when they wrap up production, somebody's got to come back and shovel all that dirt back onto the truck and uh, cart it all away. Uh, they were down there in Six Points, Texas not too long ago working on a, uh, an Adam Sandler movie. Uh, called Bedtime Stories uh, with Adam Sandler, Guy Pearce, Kerry Russell, and Courtney Cox. Uh, that movie will be out next year. Uh, now, over the years, just about every big screen cowboy you can think of has worked here at Universal, from uh, Audie Murphy and Hoot Gibson all the way up to Jimmy Stewart, Gary Cooper, John Wayne, even Clint Eastwood uh, made films here. Uh, all the legendary cowboys made movies over there in Six Points, Texas. Now, some of you will recognize this, um, or, or you'll, you'll see this big uh, building over on the left that says uh, Property on it. Uh, it houses our property collection. Uh, now a property, or prop for short, uh, is basically anything that an actor touches or holds in their hand. It can be uh, as big as a grand piano or as small as a paperclip. And we have the world's largest prop collection inside this building. Uh, more than one million separate pieces. It's like the world's greatest flea market when you're in there. Uh, the building is named after Edith Head, who was an eight-time eight Academy Award winner for costume design in Universal. Now, we're going to take you to an area that has some of the older buildings out here at Universal. Uh, it's known as the Square of Warriors. It was originally constructed in 1959 for the making of Stanley Kubrick's classic film, Spartacus. Uh, if you saw Spartacus, you might remember Lawrence Olivier standing at the top of those steps right over there, exhorting the Roman legions to go into battle with Spartacus. Uh, this area was also seen more recently in The Scorpion King with Wayne The Rock Johnson also appeared on television on the show Crossing Jordan, and it was used as the fictional country of Genovia in our driver Dennis's all-time personal favorite movie, The Princess Diaries 2, A Royal Engagement, starring Julie Andrews and Anne Hathaway. Now, he's a tough guy, but he, he loves those Julie Andrews movies. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't be ashamed, Dennis. Nothing wrong with Julie Andrews. Yeah. Now, uh, I mean, just a second, we're going to take you to an area that might look familiar to some people. Uh, we always usually have some European guests with us. Uh, this area is known as Little Europe. It was originally constructed in 1929 for the making of our first Academy Award winning film for Best Picture. That was all quiet on the Western Front, still a classic to this day. Over the years, this area has appeared as just about every major European location you can think of, and even some that you probably can't. Here to tell you how they make that happen, once again, let me... Welcome to Little Europe. This place can be made to look almost like any country you need just by changing the language of the sky and a little send decoration. Come on, Leonardo! Yes, Now, what's the floor like that to do around to get to the eh? Uh, who knew Whoopi was so multilingual? Uh, over there on your right-hand side is perhaps the most legendary area out here on the back lot. That is known as the Court of Miracles. In the 1930s, Universal put out all the original classic monster movies. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Wolfman. They all made their first appearance on screen in Universal Films. And they all made appearances right over there in the Court of Miracles. <laughs> I don't know what's more terrifying, but the uh, Court of Miracles has also been seen uh, 
in things like uh, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, one of the Charlie's Angels movies that you see with Matt LeBlanc and Lucy Liu they shot over there. Uh, television shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer with Sarah Michelle Gellar and Angel with David Boreanaz. All of Little Europe is in uh, You Don't Mess with the Zohan with Adam Sandler out right now. Right over there on your right, that courtyard back there, that Spanish courtyard, uh, that was in the first couple of Pirates of the Caribbean movies. That was actually the port of Tortuga when they were uh, recruiting their crew to go out on their quest. Uh, had their uh, had a big barroom brawl scene. Uh, that was all filmed uh, right back over there in that little courtyard. Uh, little Europe, as I said, uh, uh, has appeared in a lot of great things. It's designed to have the look of a uh, San Francisco subway station. Uh, this sort of a cool level of sound. A lot of people make it do a long, extended tracking shot. Now, a tracking shot is where they follow one character, one actor with a uh, handheld camera, usually a set of camera. They follow them through a scene that takes place in one location and it's uh -huh. Uh, don't worry, folks. Uh, we get these little tremors sometimes. It's California, after all. It's, it's not it's hang, hang on now, back there. Hang on. Now. Oh, thank goodness that's not a real truck. But that is real fire. Uh, look out back there. This afternoon snack. Oh wait, yeah, what's that? That's... Oh, 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 I don't, I don't think that's. No, that's not. I, I, I'm sorry, you had to see that, folks. Uh, uh, cover your children's eyes. They, they really shouldn't have to see that. We don't want to scar them emotionally. Um, but uh, we're okay as long as we stay up here on the pier. Uh, and uh, uh, don't worry about George. He, he's got work that's come, so he should be okay. Um, we'll be all right as long as we're. Oh, oh, he's taking the pier back there. He's taking the pier. Oh, hang on, everybody. Hang on. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, we're still hanging on by a thread as long as nothing catches on fire, which would be just fine. Oh. Uh, well, I know you spoke too soon. Uh, uh, well, you know, the fire might actually be a good thing. You know, I think, I don't think sharks really like fire very much. Whoa! Oh, there it is! He's still hungry. Somebody toss him a power bar or something. Goodness gracious. Well, uh, Bruce, the mechanical shark from Jaws, was uh, nicknamed Bruce by director Steven Spielberg after his lawyer. <laughs> Steven Spielberg's lawyer at the time was also named Bruce. You can draw whatever connections you will from that. And uh, he was working fine today, but that was uh, definitely not always the case when Steven Spielberg was making Jaws. That's a much maligned shark. It didn't really work all the time. It didn't work hardly at all. Wherever you were on the island, you could hear the radio mics. They were always saying, the shark is not working. Repeat, the shark is not working. We just waited a minute. Anybody going to the beach this weekend? Uh, it's time to warm up, you know, going to take a little swim, maybe, and yeah, splash around. Yeah. Keep your eyes open. Now, uh, this town is done by a few things right down there on what is known as Elm Street. Elm Street was also a, uh, a location used in one of our Academy Award winning films, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, starring Gregory Peck. But uh, now we're going to take it down the heart of a uh, another very, very famous street. You're going to have your cameras ready. We're about to take you to the town of Fairview. Someone ringing any bells? Well, what about 
Wisteria Lane. That's right, home to some very desperate housewives. Let's take a little look around the neighborhood here, shall we? If you look over to your hey, left, uh, this mustard-colored house coming up on your left with the columns in front of it belongs to Gabrielle. Gabrielle, played by Eva Longoria Parker. Uh, her husband, obviously, uh, uh, NBA star Tony Parker, was eliminated from the NBA playoffs by the Lakers, by the way. I'm, I'm sure we got some few Lakers fans back there. The gray house on your left is where the alternative lifestyle couple on the Styria Lane lives. That used to be 1313 Mockingbird Lane. This is Lane, the, desperate old the, the yellow house on your left belongs to Susan. Uh, Susan, played by Terry Hatcher. That used to be the Hardy Boys house on the old uh, TV show uh, The Hardy Boys with uh, Sean Cassidy. The green place on the left, the toys on the porch, of course, all those kids must belong to Lynette. Uh, that's her place. She lives there uh, with her husband. Uh, and uh, Lynette, obviously, played by Felicity Huffman. Now, as we come down here at the end of the cul-de-sac, uh, there's going to be a, a pink house over on your right-hand side. Uh, that house Hi, is where here. Edie lived. Uh, Edie played by Nicolette Sheridan. Uh, that has the distinction of being one of the few uh, fully practical houses on the street. Supposedly these houses are kind of like some of the buildings that we saw earlier, like the Six Points Texas. They're really not finished off buildings. They're really not complete structures. Uh, they're just kind of roughed in on the inside, and they can't be used for interior scenes. Most of the interior scenes are filmed on sound stages back at the front lot. The blue house on your left, Miss McCluskey, uh, built after the tornado. The brown house on your left is where Catherine Mayfair lives, played by Dana Delaney. The brick house there on your left, that's uh, Bree's house. Bree, played by the lovely and talented Marcia Cross. She lives there with her husband, Orson, played by Kyle McLaughlin. Uh, now, this is known, obviously, to people the world over who watch Desperate Housewives as Wisteria Lane. But in reality, on the back lot, it is designated as Colonial Street. Colonial Street's appeared in a lot of things over the years, everything from uh, the old uh, uh, classic comedy Animal House all the way up to uh, music videos with uh, uh, hip-hop star Nelly. And so uh, you've probably seen Colonial Street on things besides Desperate Housewives, never realized you were looking at Wisteria Lane. But uh, now that you've seen these houses up close and in three dimensions, take a look at your screens and you'll see how they appear on screen on ABC's hit show, Desperate Housewives. Now, The Grinch is actually one of the physically largest productions ever shot at Universal. It occupied ten sound stages on the front lot, really huge portions out here of the back lot. They used more than two million linear feet of styrofoam to construct all those elaborate Whoville sets and enough artificial snow to cover more than nine football fields. For those residents of Whoville, they had to deal with a lot more than just The Grinch. Because out here on the back lot, their next door neighbor was one of motion picture history's most infamous murderers, Norman Bates. On your right hand side are two of the most famous sets still standing in Hollywood. The legendary Bates Motel and the Mother's House from Alfred Hitchcock's unforgettable classic Psycho, starring Anthony Perkins and Janet Lee. I don't know, it's a little warm today. Anybody want to take a break, maybe grab a shower, maybe? Well, if you didn't see Psycho, you don't get that, but believe me, you go and watch Psycho, you won't want to take a shower for about a month after you see that movie. Now, right now, you're going to want to have your cameras handy because we're about to take you into the heart of one of the biggest sets ever constructed for the picture. A spectacular crash of site from Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. We'll stop our tram after we uh, get in here. You're free to stand up at that time if you need to get some better pictures. Have your cameras ready. We're going in. All right, as we come to a stop, you can stand up if you need to, get some better pictures. Uh, this incredible set is the remains of the neighborhood where Tom Cruise's character hides out early during the War of the Worlds. The plane that you're looking at is a Tom Cruise's This plane was actually purchased from a major airline after it had been decommissioned for only about $60,000. Uh, pretty good price for a uh, 747. You get some SUVs that SUVs, I think. But uh, it cost more than $200,000 in transportation costs to bring it here and put it in place on the Universal back lot. But now we're going to show you this lovely little cabin over here on your right-hand side, all set for a nice weekend to getaway. That's what they used it for on shows like Desperate Housewives and Las Vegas. It was featured in the movie Shooter, starring Mark Wahlberg. But it was actually built uh, quite a few years ago for something just a little bit different.
great outdoors with the great John Candy. Uh, now, further off to the right-hand side, you'll notice that body of water over there. That is known as Falls Lake. Uh, a man-made body of water. There used to be a real lake out there, a little waterfall, but it's uh, all the development. It's now just a, a man-made pond. Uh, it's obviously not a very big body of water, but when it's used with that big blue backdrop, uh, it can be made to look like any ocean in the world, like the Atlantic, the Pacific. Uh, take a look at your uh, screens. All of these scenes were filmed right over there on Paul.